<laughs> You're listening to the first 50 gigs, Guns N' Roses, and the making of Appetite for Destruction, featuring Steve Darrow, bass player for the new Hollywood Rose. So, Stephen, at this point, you were rehearsing with all the guys. Izzy leaves and joins London. And then you and the new Hollywood Rose play about five gigs together, most of them Mark documented, starting with June 16th at Madame Wong's West. What do you remember about the four or five gigs that you played together with Axel, Stephen, and Slash? What I remember about the first gig the most, uh, the Madame Wong's, was that, uh, oddly enough, it was, I think, Steve Adler's, I want to say his first live show, it was all amped up, like even more amped up than usual and, and a little bit nervous. And uh, he didn't even know, like the sound man at Bad Wong's had to say, no, dude, you, you need we need to put a microphone in your, in your bass drums, both of them. Uh, you need to cut a hole. So, we, you know, like you see everybody out there in pictures and they have holes cut in their bass drum, you know, and, and you got to do that. And he was like, oh, what? Why? And he had to run around the block <laughs> to let off some steam. Again, Mark was probably there and it was not a whole lot of other people in the audience besides our girlfriends and Mark. So this is the June 16th show. So what comes to mind? Probably the first thing people are going to notice is, you know, you can see Slash's face through his hair, which was the case back then. Um, no, no top hat yet. No Les Paul yet. His marshals he had traded in for um, Rissen, which were local amp company made in Orange County, which were uh, kind of new at the time. And a lot of people were switching over, uh, Motley Crue included, Lita Ford. Uh, Axel, obviously, the next thing probably people notice is Axel's sort of Duran Duran type, type of suit, which uh, I don't know what was the vibe that he was going for then. Uh, could have been anywhere from Hanoi Rocks to Duran Duran to uh, Mick Jagger, or David Bowie that he was going for. The next one I see coming up is definitely a drum set that didn't get seen much in later years. Steve's Tama, double bass, lots of cymbals, two China cymbals, uh, large drums. He played all of them all the time. The first jam that me and Izzy and Axel had with no bass player me playing drums that's exactly pretty much exactly the same thing that Izzy was trying to reiterate by saying well you're not crying you're not the right stylistic drummer for this uh and Steve when he came in was blazing I mean, he was he did fine at being that kind of drummer cream magazine t-shirt that was cool Axel had and that was an original one it was before there was fucking reissues of any of this stuff made this was like almost old-fashioned at the time like early 80s this would have been kind of like oh cream magazine doesn't that was so five years ago or something but very cool boy howdy t-shirt and what was cream magazine cream magazine was like the coolest american rock magazine of all time um, it wasn't rolling stone and it wasn't circus and it wasn't any of these later magazines that you probably people might remember from the 80s. Let's talk about what Slash was, was playing on and what kind of sound was coming out. Well, he had gotten uh, always, this was like the newest, coolest custom BC Ridge Warlock at the time. Not cheap at all. Yeah, I, I believe he got that at Hollywood Music, which where Angus Cohen is now, on you know just north of Melrose and Fairfax. Uh, and he worked there, so he he must have you know, you know, taken a little bit out of his paycheck or put down layaway or whatever. I, I do remember it being like a, maybe twenty five hundred bucks or something like that. It was it was a lot of money. Like someone in our in our financial situation should not have been able to own one of those guitars, and he did. And he had BC Riches previous to that too, as you look in the old pictures, Rug Crew and Ty Sloan and whatnot. He was playing like another nice old BC Rich, which was more of what Joe Perry played in the live bootleg days. I remember even in the, another thing about the transition between the, the different roses and the Hollywood rose and whatnot. I mean, I remember even once 
Axel sort of took charge of this lineup. You know, it wasn't Izzy calling the shots and coming up with direction so much. It was, it was Axel's like idea. He's like, I want to kind of, you know, I want to do the same stuff we were always doing, but a little bit more street. You said something very interesting. You said that, you know, Axel was beginning to call the shots here because Izzy wasn't around. Yeah, he's he always was Axel. Even if he wasn't, even if he was just doing what someone else came up with, he was always Axel. And he always had his, his ideas and his persona and stuff like that. It's just, I think it became more and more upfront. And same with Slash. You know, once Izzy was temporarily out, Slash had a lot more to do with um, coming up with a different sound. And Axel had more to do with like, what you know, what to do, where to take the sound visually on stage. And it wasn't all that much different than the early days, but you could tell it was. I mean, just just looking at the pictures, you can tell. So, so the next gig, gig was at the Troubadour on July 10th. Did you feel like there was a a following that was growing for Hollywood Rose at that time? Not necessarily. You know, it was all just like I said. It was all basically we were going through the every band in LA, especially at times like back then when there was thousands and thousands of bands or hundreds at that point, you had to sort of work your way up no matter what, what no matter how good you sounded or how good you looked or whatever, you had to pay your dues at these opening the weeknights and play into small crowds. And uh, once you got into the Troubadour and the Whiskey and Zari's, you had to get into the pay to play situation, which was basically Either you came up and if you were an unknown band, you either had to come up with seven, eight hundred dollars cash and give that to them in advance. <laughs> to watch the entire episode and access the full series, bonus episodes, and image galleries from Mark's extensive archive, join our growing community on Patreon and subscribe. If you've enjoyed this preview, then like our video, comment below, and subscribe for more.